Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines and speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. On today's program, we speak with renowned American rabbi and the founder of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, Mark Schneier, to find out what a peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel would mean for the Middle East. We ask him if the ongoing negotiations are proving to be successful or if Benjamin Netanyahu's most right-wing government in history is more likely to continue expanding settlements while rejecting Palestinian rights. Rabbi, thank you for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. Now, you are the author of a renowned book on what unites and divides Jews and Muslims. Uh, you are based in the United States. And of course, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has just given quite a famous interview to Fox News where he said that Saudi Arabia is getting closer with every day to peace with Israel. So, frankly speaking, just how close do you think we really are? I think we're very close. I don't believe we're on the cusp of saying this rapprochement, one might say, between Israel and Saudi Arabia. But the prerequisite is that there needs to be some serious engagement between the state of Israel and the Palestinians. I think that's uh, the only hurdle that's left on the table. Uh, not a very hurdle, uh, not, not, not very easy hurdle to overcome. Uh, but I believe that's the uh, final hurdle uh, in seeing uh, these two countries coming closer together. Now, you say it has to be an authentic peace, of course, and there really is that major challenge, isn't there? Because as per the Saudi conditions, this deal puts the rights of Palestinians first. Now, as we all know, in order to return to power, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had to reach out to the far right for their support. So I have to ask, is it even conceivable that this government, it is the most far right in Israel's history, will it ever agree to any concessions towards Palestinians? I could see that happening. I could see uh, members of this coalition uh, refusing to give any concessions. Um, at the same time, that not only in Israel, but within Judaism, the ultimate goal and objective is the pursuit of peace. But it has to be a genuine peace, it has to be an authentic peace. You know, on the Palestinian side, you know, the question one has, whether or not the current Palestinian leadership uh, can actually bring, you know, many of these promises and guarantees to fruition. Uh, does the Palestinian leadership have the support? Uh, does it have the uh, backing of the Palestinian people? I mean, these are some very, very difficult questions. Um, but, you know, thank God we've, we've come to this point and there will need to be concessions, you know, on both sides. Uh, but I would not rule out uh, any uh, personality, any political party, uh, anyone when it comes to uh, concessions for a genuine, real, authentic peace. And certainly Saudi is willing to negotiate. Uh, we saw in that same Fox News uh, interview with the Crown Prince, he said, we've got to work with whoever's there, whoever is leading Israel. But I think it was uh, the New York Times columnist, Tom Friedman, he laid it out quite well in a recent column where he said it would be a very interesting conversation to listen into when the current right-wing members of Netanyahu's government are given that choice between continuing their annexing and settling policies versus a peace deal with Saudi Arabia and with all of the remaining Muslim and Arab countries, essentially. So I have to ask, what option do you think they will choose? I think it must have been a very interesting conversation to overhear someone to the right, like Richard Nixon, uh, making peace with China, which was a very interesting conversation to overhear when President Ronald Reagan 
um, was instrumental in bringing down the Soviet Union, uh, who's also an ultra conservative. I'm sure it was a very interesting conversation until we hear when uh, the late Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin uh, made peace with Egypt. And, and often, when it comes to these negotiations, when it comes to these concessions, you need the people uh, who are more to the right to lend credibility and legitimacy and authenticity uh, to what would be a genuine and real peace. So I'm, I'm not concerned about that. Uh, again, my concern is that this Palestinian-Israeli conflict has just gone on year after year after year. Uh, there are issues on all sides here. It's not black and white. Um, and uh, hopefully we can find some way of arriving at these concessions. And I think it does remain to be seen whether Netanyahu and his party do really want and support this deal. However, we do constantly hear this deal is too important to fail. So with that in mind, do you think that the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, can he or should he intervene to prevent internal politics from ruining what could be a truly historic peace treaty, not only for Saudi and Israel, but really for the entire region? Listen, President Isaac Herzog happens to be one of my closest friends. Uh, we have a tradition that where he never visits the Muslim world without my accompanying him. So whether it was last December uh, to Bahrain to meet His Majesty, whether it was back in May uh, to meet the uh, president of Azerbaijan, President Aliyev, or the start rapprochement that I facilitated between President Erdogan and President Herzog in 2022. So I know something about Isaac Herzog. If the coalition agrees to the peace, I know that Prime Minister Netanyahu will be able to deliver on that peace. My question is, will the Palestinian leadership have that same credibility in terms of being able to deliver on that peace? Does the current Palestinian leadership have the support, have the backing of the Palestinian people? For me, that's a big question mark. And what would you say? Do you feel it could be empty, broken promises? No, but I think that's precisely where the Gulf states need to enter the picture. I don't think that the Palestinian uh, leadership uh, could possibly arrive at some kind of uh, resolution with the Israelis without the participation of countries like Saudi Arabia, like UAE, like Bahrain, even like you know Qatar and, and, and others. Um, and Israel will need the assistance, uh, particularly of the Crown Prince and uh, KSA, to deliver on this peace. And certainly we are seeing that relationship uh, evolving. We're seeing a lot more business and tech deals, uh, I think, with uh, Israel and the Gulf states continuing as well. It does feel like a lot of those conversations are taking part. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what the temperature is like in the US where you were based, because, of course, you are a prominent religious figure and uh, a leader of the Jewish community over there in New York. So how do American Jews feel about the prospect of a peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel? Well, I think the American Jewish community is a sad, but I think the American Jewish community is a bit naive. I don't believe that most American Jews, for that matter, most American Jewish leaders, understand the importance of the prerequisite that has been put, put forth by the Crown Prince in terms of a resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There are some who are Pollyannish, you know, so that maybe uh, Saudi Arabia will take the uh, UAE approach, the Bahrain approach. We'll make peace now, then we'll deal with the Palestinians later. I don't believe that is the approach of the Crown Prince. And I think in that regard, uh, not only Jews in the United States, but Jews around the world, including in Israel, being a bit naive in not appreciating the importance of resolving this Israeli-Palestinian conflict once and for all. 
And certainly the US has played a major role in these discussions. And the deal would also include the US removing restrictions on the sale of weapons to Saudi Arabia. Uh, they've also asked for help with the peaceful nuclear program that, that Saudi wants to create and having a written security pact in place. Now, provided that a peace deal does happen with Israel, there, there shouldn't be any concerns left with these things going forward, wouldn't you agree? No, I do agree. And I think that all of those points, uh, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and US, be the administration, Congress, would be on the same page. I'm going to keep coming back <laughs> to my refrain here. I think it's all wonderful. I think it's all dandy. Uh, however, uh, there is this prerequisite. And that, to me, is the biggest hurdle. It's the final one. But it's the biggest hurdle. Can we resolve this Israeli-Palestinian conflict? And certainly, uh, certainly a big challenge remains. So many lives, I think, are at risk with this deal as well if it does not go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask your thoughts. Uh, I mentioned at the start of the interview, fascinating uh, discussion we saw on Fox News recently with the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. I'd be really interested to hear what you felt were the major standouts uh, of the interview. First, that the Crown Prince represented himself in a very human, in a very personal way, that uh, very few people had the opportunity to really uh, hear from him, particularly in English. Um, and that connected with the audience. I think that was first and foremost. Uh, um, his um, comments on uh, uh, the future of the uh, Saudi-Israeli uh, Peace, reconciliation, Ralph Rochemal, uh, not only resonated uh, with uh, American Jews and uh, people in Washington, but let's remember there's 60 million evangelical Christians here in Israel, I mean, here in the US, uh, whose magnificent obsession, their passion, their preoccupation is the state of Israel defending the state of Israel and supporting the state of Israel. And I heard from some of my evangelical friends who are in the leadership of this group how refreshing it is to hear from the great leader of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, his genuine desire um, and dream to see a peace, uh, not only with Israel, uh, but for uh, a peaceful coexistence for the entire region. And certainly the Crown Prince did say that the negotiations are going well so far. As we mentioned at the start of the interview, he said we are moving closer every day to creating this peace with Israel. But uh, I want to turn your attention to the Abraham Accords because it's now been uh, more than three years since Israel signed peace treaties with countries such as the UAE, uh, Sudan, Morocco and Bahrain as well. How would you rate the Accords and what do you think they have? have achieved in the last three years? Well, I think the accords have been uh, revolutionary. Uh, I've been to uh, Dubai and to Abu Dhabi. Uh, I remember two years ago in December, I believe there were 150,000, 150,000 Israelis uh, that visited Dubai that December. And it was a love fest. And it was something very natural. People were asking me, Rabbi, what do you think? Uh, this accord is so natural. And now I put on my rabbinic hat and my theological hat because at the end of the day, Muslims and Jews, we are family. We're cousins. We may, ha we may have had a few family disagreements, but there are no two other religions that have more in common and have that historic bond uh, than uh, Islam and Judaism. So for me, it's a natural progression. Yeah, I'm more comfortable wearing my kippah, wearing my skull cap in Bahrain than I am in Berlin. Um, so I think it's just a natural progression for Muslims and Jews to be coming back together.
Well, you've called the Abraham Accords revolutionary and you say essentially uh, this has been a, a family rift with the cousins. But I'm going to challenge that a little bit about their success because I recently had the honour of interviewing former Saudi intelligence chief Prince Turkey Al Faisal on our program. Now, he was quite critical of the Accords. In fact, he said there is no evidence that embracing Israel has made it any more lenient towards the Palestinians. And uh, I would have to say it feels like the facts support that argument when we consider there is more violence towards the Palestinians and more right-wing provocations than ever before. Well, that's also, you know, the course of life, you know, before you enter the next phase, whether it's professionally, whether it's personally, uh, there's usually some kind of seismic activity. Um, so I respectfully disagree with you know, the princes and fellow. Uh, to his opinion, but we wouldn't be discussing the possibility of a peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia and up in for the Abraham Accords. So, you know, it takes time for things to settle in. But uh, I know people to people in Bahrain, in uh, the UAE, in Morocco, in Israel, uh, that there's a very, very genuine a heartfelt feeling in terms of reaching out to the other. Um, so I would respectfully disagree. And I take your point. You say there has to be a natural course of life. But to be very honest, there's many lives that are hanging in the balance. There's many lives that have been lost while the Palestinian-Israeli uh, dispute continues on, despite the Abraham Accords. But, uh, but let's talk a little bit more widely about the region, uh, specifically towards Turkey. Now, the Times of Israel, they are credited as being the secret force behind Israel's rekindled flame with Turkey. But uh, in fact, many claim it was you who brought President Erdogan and President Herzog together. So I have to ask, what is the true story behind that headline? Well, the true story is that I did facilitate the historic rapprochement between President Erdogan and President Herzog between Turkey and Israel. Uh, my partner in this was Ambassador Murat Mershan, who is Turkey's ambassador to the United States. Um, it was eight months of some very, very uh, diligent, uh, tireless negotiations. Um, but we had willing partners on both sides. And the culmination was uh, March 2022, when I accompanied President Herzog to meet President Erdogan in Ankara. And I just met with President Erdogan last week. Uh, he met with uh, 12 American Jewish leaders. And boy, oh boy, have we come a long way in a very short time because now they're preparing for Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit uh, to Turkey for the end of the year. And President Erdogan made very clear of his intent to visit the state of Israel um, after Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit. So I believe uh, it's a 180 degree turn uh, before March, 2022, the uh, state of relations between Israel and Turkey was one of conflict. Today is one of uh, great cooperation. President Erdogan has demonstrated time and time again his genuine, sincere commitment to uh, building these ties, to strengthening these ties. Uh, so, yes, I'm very, very proud of the role that I've played and looking forward to playing similar roles with other countries in terms of bringing the Muslim world closer to the state of and I think a key part of that, as you say, there were willing parties on both sides. So I think we still don't know whether both sides are truly willing and whether they both uh, truly have the support of their people. But, uh, but I want to uh, turn your attention to that very same story we just mentioned, because it also describes you as the rabbi to many jet setters, celebrities, hedge fund whales as well. Do you accept that that is a fair description of yourself? It's a generous description. <laughs> it's it, it's a very gracious description. I have many, many friends, uh, but I'm particularly proud of the friends that I have among the leaders in the both the Muslim and the Arab worlds. 
And I pioneered this field, Muslim-Jewish relations, more than 20 years ago. And even I'm grateful to my friends for helping to promote uh, and to project you know, our book, Sons of Abraham. Uh, it was at the directive of Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the ruler of UAE, that the book was recently translated uh, into Arabic, and he is insistent that the Hebrew translation uh, come from Dubai, the King of Morocco, translated to French. President we don't know of Indonesia, into Indonesia, the largest Muslim-majority country. President Aliyev is translating the book into Azeri and into Russian. And I can go on and on and on. My uh, hyper-focus, my preoccupation, is to find the path to narrow the gap, the chasm, the divide, between 1.6 billion Muslims and 16 million Jews. Uh, the journey has begun. We've had some tremendous, tremendous victories along this journey. I know we're just going to see more and more to come. Well, we congratulate you on your success uh, for sure. I want to pick up on what you said. Uh, you're particularly proud of your relationship with the Arab and Muslim leaders in this part of the world. Uh, I understand that you were directly involved in helping Qatar secure the World Cup bid uh, some time ago. So tell me about your involvement with that. Well, back in 2000, I think it was either 17 or 18, uh, at the directive of Sheikh Samim, the Emir of Qatar, Hassan al Thawani, Secretary General of the uh, FIFA World Cup in Qatar, approached me, would I serve in the role as an interfaith advisor to the World Cup? And I agreed to on three conditions. First, that they would allow 15,000 Israelis to attend the World Cup. Uh, second, there would be direct flights during the World Cup between Doha and Tel Aviv. And third, that we would facilitate kosher food. Uh, the Qataris, true to form, checked off all three boxes. They delivered on all their promises. Um, we had delicious kosher food. I called it my bagel diplomacy. Uh, apparently, we, we, we brought the first bagels ever uh, to Doha, uh, to Qatar. I mean, even uh, Akbar al-Baker, who's the uh, chairman of uh, QA, Qatar Airways, uh, gave us the VIP kitchen of QA in Doha that we were able to turn into a kosher kitchen for a month uh, to kosherize that kitchen. It was a real team effort. And it's a great, great credit to my friends in Qatar that uh, they fulfilled all their commitments, all their promises, so that Jews, Israelis were made to feel welcome there. And finally, before we go, I have to ask, we hear that you are backing Arab News' campaign to support the bid for Riyadh to host Expo 2030. So tell us, in your own words, why Riyadh? Because I, I think people don't appreciate what the kingdom has done from an interreligious point of view. We know about all the changes, all the reformations, politically, economically, but you should know that Saudi Arabia, because I was there, was the first of the Gulf states uh, to reach out uh, to other faiths, reach out to the West from an inter-religious point of view. Uh, it was the King Abdullah Center uh, established you know, by the uh, late king. Um, that was the first interfaith, interreligious center uh, ever championed, ever uh, sponsored, you know, by a uh, Gulf country. So I think people need to appreciate the uh, very prominent role that the kingdom has played from an interreligious point of view, and, and 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 a role where in the kingdom. They celebrate not only our common faith, but our common fate. And you now have the crown prince, who is a ruler, who understands and, and sees each and every person uh, as a human being, who, who is a child of God, and who is entitled to be treated with the dignity, the justice, and the compassion that we claim for ourselves.
Very sage, uh, very sage words indeed. I have to say, we are delighted to be supporting Riyadh's uh, bid for the opportunity to host Expo 2030. Very pleased to have your support as well. Rabbi, thank you very much for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Katie. And maybe I'll bring my bagel diplomacy to 2030 Expo. <laughs> We're going to be holding you to that. Make sure you bring enough for all the crowds. Thank you very much.